Hi everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Christina and I'm the events coordinator here at Books Are Magic. Before we get started, I just wanted to point out some logistics for how tonight's going to go. We'll be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the event, so start thinking of questions to ask now. After the talk tonight, Stephen will be signing and personalizing books at the desk near where you checked in. We also have additional books available to purchase from my colleagues at the register. If you're joining us virtually on the live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of The Celebrants Online using the link in the live stream description. It's my pleasure to introduce you all tonight to The Celebrants, a deeply honest tribute to the growing pains of selfhood and the people who keep us going, coupled with Stephen Rowley's signature humor and heart, the Celebrance is a moving tale about the false invincibility of youth and the beautiful ways in which friendship helps us celebrate our lives, even amid the deepest challenges of living. Stephen Rowley is the best-selling author of four novels, including Lily and the Octopus, a Washington Post notable book of 2016, the editor and NPR best book of 2019, and the Gunkel, finalist for the Th Thurber Prize for American Humor and Goodreads finalist for Novel of the Year. His fiction has been translated in 20 languages. He resides in Palm Springs, California. Stephen will be joined in conversation tonight by Grant Ginder. Grant Ginder is the author of five novels, including The People We Hate at the Wedding, soon to be a major motion picture. Originally from Southern California, Ginder received his MFA from NYU, where he teaches writing. Let's all give a very warm welcome to Stephen and Grant. <laughs> These pink glasses, I was like, ooh, rosé. <laughs> it's water. We may or may not have tied a few on before this event, so I don't know if you need rosé right now, but good luck. <laughs> it's, it's pride, my tolerance is up. Um, <laughs> Stephen, hi. Hi, Hello. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing all these familiar faces in the, in the crowd. It's like, uh, you know, a homecoming week. I was trying to <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, you've had, uh, Busy three weeks, month, year, year. <laughs> I mean, something like that. You all must be so terribly sick. <laughs> <of me. laughs> never, never. So catch us up before we get into the book. Catch us up on what you've been doing. Start us at, like like paint the picture of you finding out about the Genepic. Walk us through your yellow suit on the Today Show. Go for it. <laughs> the yellow suit has taken on a life of its own. Uh, and uh, so, so for those who don't, was this in the introduction? We weren't listening backstage. But so the celebrants was the, the read with Jenna. There's usually like a poster of it right here. Read with Jenna book club pick for which which is a great honor for those who who I mean you're all book fans here. You know that that, that publishing is sort of changing is being driven by these celebrity uh, book clubs now. So Reese and and Jenna and the, the godmother Oprah. And so getting getting tapped for one of these is, is truly a really you know great honor in, in publishing and so so but there's this great mystery around it i didn't know how it would happen but i got the call in uh, well i had the opportunity to talk with jenna uh by zoom in i think it was like last october or something um and it was just a chat and it, you know maybe it was an audition i don't i really don't know but it was just a chat and it was really exciting because i just kind of turned in the book and so i hadn't talked about the book with anybody and wow. you know you know this when you write something yeah. it's yours for and yours alone for a very long time so i was like oh somebody else has met these people like great let's it's like we had friends in common yeah. so we had this chat. <laughs> and then i found out in december i think and then i had to keep a secret for a very long time oh my god <laughs> I would never be able to do it. Oh, it's awful. It Terrible. was awful. Yeah, uh, I told I told my husband Byron. For those who don't know, I, my husband is Byron Lane, another writer. Um, you guys share an editor, in fact, who's He's here, here tonight, I think. James, raise your hand. Oh, there he is. There he is. Yeah, hi, Nick. Uh, so uh, Byron and I have books come out the same day, which is another crazy which is like both thing. like a blessing or divorce. <laughs> Yeah, people want to know if we planned it that way, and the answer is yes. No, no, there's no way, there's literally no way we could have. Um, you know, we have different publishers and different editors and different agents, and 
you know, we even wrote them at slightly different times. Um, there was a point to this. Oh, I told Byron uh, the secret, but that was it was really difficult to keep from screaming it from the mountaintops. Now the yellow suit. Yeah. So Stephen wore this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Stephen wore this like fabulous, incredible, very bright yellow suit on the Today Show. Talk us through that decision. I did. Well, I had worn this other suit. So in April, another reason you're all going to be sick of me is that I won the Thurber Prize for American Humor, which. Um, Woo! <laughs> Thank you. I, well, the, the reason I bring that up is not for the applause, but because I had worn another suit that night and I was feeling pretty right. good. The award ceremony is in Columbus, Ohio, where James Thurber is from. And uh, I w had worn this other suit. And, and so this is big ceremony and people come in and, and it's a huge event. And anyway, I was feeling pretty good and, and people came up to me all night and said, God, I wish I were brave enough to wear something like that. <laughs> <laughs> And at first I was, I took it very sincerely. I was like, oh, it's very easy. You know, you put one leg in one fabric tube yeah. <laughs> and the other leg in the other fabric tube. You zip it and up. You zip it up and yeah. you're halfway there. And then, but then the eighth or ninth time you hear something like that, you're like, I don't think this is a compliment, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I bought this yellow suit for the Today Show, and I, which I was also excited about. Yeah. But then, you know, I've been on tour for like four weeks now and in a hotel rooms, there's literally nothing to do in the middle of the night and I can't sleep. So I'm like, I'm gonna try on the yellow suit. This was in <laughs> Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> and I put on that yellow suit and all I could picture was Curious George. <laughs> yeah. Man in the yellow hat. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm gonna go on the Today Show and Al Roker is gonna be like, that man lost a monkey. <laughs> so I was in like panic, like, but I yeah. can't run out in Louisville in the middle of the night and buy a new, buy a new suit, suit. So I'm like, right. I'm, I'm sort of committed right. to it. I, I almost was like, I should just double down and get a hat. Oh, you know? oh my God, a hat would have been amazing. <laughs> uh, well, you looked great. Okay, let's move on to the book. Let's move okay. on to the book. So I, I usually hate this question because it, it, it people ask it at every reading, but with, with your book, and I actually think it, it, it's an important one because the conceit of this book is is so original and so specific. So can you talk a little bit about the inspiration um, and sort of just walk us through your process in terms of in where it came from? Yeah, I'm, so this is the, sort of my last event on on the travel portion of this tour. And so it's a weird thing. The book's been out for a couple of weeks now. So some people have read it, some people haven't. But those who don't know, it's about a group of college friends from the class of 1995 who make a very unique pact after losing one of their classmates to suicide and attending his funeral, they decide if only um, he had been there to, to, to hear the things that were said about him at his funeral, that maybe he might have made a different choice. So they decide, since they're about to scatter, you know, in different directions after graduation, to come together at a moment's notice to throw each other their own funeral in their sort of low moment in life as an insurance policy, hopefully to re-inspire some passion for living and, and remind them how necessary they are here. And so, wait, what was the question? <laughs> oh, the inspiration, the inspiration behind, behind the yeah. book. Uh, early in the pandemic, like many, I was scrolling through Netflix and I almost said the A word in an independent bookstore. Let's say Hulu, oh, yeah. Hulu, uh, looking for something. <laughs> Good pivot. Yeah, yeah, looking for, for something to watch. And I stumbled on The Big Chill, right? Because I was yeah. looking for this, does anybody remember this movie? Yeah. So I was looking for something that I had a passing familiarity with that might bring some comfort, but I didn't know all that well. And it is also a story about college friends who reunite after the death of one of their own. And it's about the stresses of the middle, middle age and what the back half of their lives are gonna look like. And all the characters in that movie are 35, <laughs> 35 years old. So 40 years ago, that's what like sort of middle age and it was done. <laughs> Yeah, I know, it's, it's kind of enraging. Right? Yeah. As someone who was, I was turning 50 that year, so I was like very, very upset uh, <laughs> by that. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, like not only that, the title, The Big Chill itself, sort of referred to this long stretch in the middle period of life where um, you were married, perhaps, and had kids and, and owned a home, which is something that people used to be able to do, and uh, had one job and were sort of working, you know, at that company mm -hmm. until re pension and retirement, and not a lot changed until the kids grew up and left the house. And, but now, I was like, we're more apt to have uh, perhaps more than one marriage or a blended family, or mm -hmm. certainly like career reinvention happens. You know, no one works just one one mm -hmm. job anymore. So it suddenly occurred to me that this is where like the great, you know, opportunity for storytelling was, was in these 
sort of middle years? You know, I'm going to admit something right now. I've never seen The Big Chill. I'm going to say, I'm 35. I'm <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I, uh, but my, my association with it is my, my parents on road trip who are like, like died in the wool baby boomers. Yeah. They like, that was the soundtrack that we always oh, listened sure. to was the big chill soundtrack. And so I never actually knew what the big chill referred to. Like I never knew what the title was. I didn't you either learn until something new during every research day. for this book. I thought it was the dead body. I thought it was like on, he's on ice. You know? like that's, the, that's the big so chill. Morbid. That's like the big chill. And I said, okay, yeah. I'm gonna pivot away from that. So, so you, this book is it, it, it's wonderful in that. I mean, obviously for all the reasons that Stephen talked about, it, it, it's about it's about friendship. It's about um, sort of moving through these different phases in life. But it's also about place. You do such an incredible job in this book. Uh, writing about place, it, you move us from um, from Big Sur to Puerto Vallarta to New York to San Francisco. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role that place plays in the book and also about the role that place plays for you as a writer. Because in, in, in your previous books, in the Gonkle, for example, like Palm Springs, is a huge role in that book. So, so explain that a little bit. Well, the Google made sense because I actually live in Palm Springs, so that was just laziness. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I actually didn't live in Palm Springs at the time I was largely writing that book. Um, huh. So, uh, place is where I want to buy real estate next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so, big start. Uh, no, you know, I don't know, other than uh, there is something, it was like, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, conversations between writers and, and artists about um, how we respond to the past few years mm -hmm. that we've lived through. And so something about this book in telling um, the people that you care about, what they mean to you in your life now, was definitely a reaction to the past few years, although I conveniently skipped 2019 to yeah. 2023, because that's my prerogative, and I don't want to, <laughs> I'm not ready to go back there. Um, so, uh, but I think, the, I think that place, it was because what I was missing so much while writing this was, travel sort of two things the intimate gathering with with friends yeah. uh and then and then more broadly travel and being able to be part of the world and so having these destinations you know big sur puerto vallarta new york city that felt uh very aspirational to me at the time that i was mm -hmm. kind of stuck at home uh writing this book and i just i just wanted to go there and if i couldn't actually go there i was going to go there in the in the pages of my book so a follow-up question to that. So all those places are where these, these various living funerals take place. So a follow-up question to that is where would your living funeral take place? <laughs> I don't know that I want one. You know, like, I really don't know. I said, I said this on the stage show. It, it's like, uh, I'm not sure if it's right for me, but uh, unless we go full-on roast. I'm oh. like, that's what they like. If we're going to do it, let's do it, right? Okay. If I'm going to wear the yellow suit, I'm going to get a hat. If yeah. we're going to do... <laughs> A living funeral. I'd rather have a. I'd rather you just light me on fire and sure. roast the hell sure. out of me. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, so where? I don't know that it really matters as long as there's some sick burns. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That can be arranged. So, so in addition to place, you also capture the 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 lingua franca of this group of friends who's known each other for for really like thirty years, right? Sorry, lingua franca. <laughs> <laughs> Is that French? <laughs> the various, you know, the language that they speak with one another. Um, Grant also <laughs> teaches college. <laughs> I'm just a workaday writer <laughs> who is sometimes takes French on Duolingo. I mean, I like, I like, I like teach college. Yeah. Okay, so so anyway, you you capture the tone of conversation that exists among a group of friends in this book very well. Um. Was any of that inspired by, by your experiences with your friends? And a sub-question to that, can you explain the Courtney scale to this group of people and then judge what Courtney this would be? God, I thought you would take easy, take it easy on I me. Mean, last, I just said last <laughs> night of the tour, I am fried. My brain is fried. I haven't been home in four weeks. I've slept in a different bed every night. Um, okay, second part of the question first. No. Okay. Uh, no, what was the, oh, the lingua franca. Uh, I don't know, it was just such a great joy of writing a book about a group of friends like this was um, 
that uh, sort of not only creating these characters, but then creating the friendships in a, in a way that felt lived in and time worn and creating these inside jokes with amongst the friends, like the Courtney scale, which we'll get to in a minute, but don't, in a way that doesn't- That's part of the book. Yeah, <laughs> in a way that doesn't exclude the reader, because I really want the reader to feel like a member of this sort of group yeah. um, of friends. And that's sort of hard to do, but there's something great about college friendships. And listen, you don't, a, a pack like this, it doesn't need to be among college friends. It could be, you know, siblings or, cousins or grade school friends or what have you. But the unique thing about college friends, I think, is sometimes you're assigned by like a random housing algorithm or something, you know? It's like we filled out a housing questionnaire and you get roommates and you have people on your floor and sometimes those are your friends and like, you may not have something in common to begin with, but soon you have history in common and the college experience in common and, and, and you're sort of, um, <laughs> This is being live streamed, so I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble, but I was gonna be like stuck for life. Sorry, college friends. Um, but uh, so it was fun to create these sort of unique personalities. But what I love about longtime groups of friends like that is you don't always have to be your best self mm -hmm. with them. These are the people who are sort of required to love you, mm -hmm. whether you uh, are be you know behaving perfectly in any given moment or or whatnot. They've known you for a long time, they've stuck with you, and hopefully um, they're the ones who are gonna see you through. The Courtney scale, I don't know where I came up with that, but it, the characters in the book are sort of assign everything as either two Courtney Love, two Courtney Cox, or two Courtney Thorne Smith. <laughs> um, Alan McBeal and Melrose Place, for those who aren't quite as Gen X as I am. Um, and so what Courtney is, the, uh, like I feel like my, my experience, like, like dragging myself to the airport tomorrow, I'm gonna to be very Courtney Love. Very Cause I'd be like yeah. just yeah. limping across the finish yeah. line. A little hungover. A little hungover. Yeah, yeah. whose fault yeah. is that? Yeah. Should we have a second class? Yeah. Yeah. I paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but this tonight, Oh, look at all these beautiful friends in the This is very Courtney Cox. I'm just surrounded by too many Really? Friends, I was so. gonna say this is Courtney Friend Smith. Oh, just sweet? Well, yeah, I, yeah. They, they're so sweet looking. Yeah, they're they all are. so sweet looking. Yeah. Courtney Cox, interesting. Yeah, but we'll they, to, they we'll might to... go off and marry a David Arquette. Oh, oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Yeah. There's, a, there's a dark underpinning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about research because um, in addition to all the work about place and, and lingua franca, there, um, there you, you weave in like a, a surprising amount of research into this book, but you do so in a way where you never actually, it never feels like you're reading anything like didactic or reading anything like you're not like reading like a textbook or anything, but you you hit on subjects from from art dealing to the history of Puerto Vallarta to what it feels like to take mushrooms. <laughs> I research research. I, I was going to say, like I, I, like a few months ago, I wrote a scene about a group of people taking mushrooms, and I felt that to get that scene accurate, mm -hmm. I needed to do a little research, which was very this helpful. This is why we're friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so talk to me about your experience writing that scene. <laughs> we don't want to talk about art theft instead. <laughs> we want to talk Let's about, talk about this, yeah. in particular. Uh, no, I, first of all, I love this question because my editor is here tonight as well, too. And I love that you are highlighting all the work that goes into a book like this, even though it might feel seamless. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, you know, I had a question like this at one point, and, and it, the way the person framed it was like, you know, so, so the, the art forgery and this and that and the other thing, and, and, and they were like, is it do you just know everything and no i know nothing that's the yeah. that's the secret of it all i don't know anything until i start reading you know yeah. and so reading is such a crucial part to the writing uh process do you like the research i do like the research i like the research for a lot of reasons but mostly in case i'm ever feeling stuck i've got a whole notebook of things to mm -hmm. to go back to and hopefully there's something in there that will inspire me and get me unstuck uh, right. in that I, I and yes i did take mushrooms yeah uh, <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> that's what i wanted to hear no. uh i it's fine i love the research too but it's i, I like fact, it because we should all come to palm springs my swimming pool is big uh, just about uh, just about this size actually we could all get in i shouldn't have gotten you that there's this amazing like protozoa that that you start to see at the bottom of the pool oh, like <laughs> swimming under you uh, it's incredible highly recommend i like i love the research because it means i don't have to write 
if I'm researching. Oh, well, there's such a thing as too much research. Yeah, you can become enchanted with the yeah. research, in which case you're just an academic and not a writer <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Teaching. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so, so research or not, the, the, the book is, the book is very funny. I mean, there are, there are laugh out loud moments. The dialogue is so incredible. Um, which should not be surprising because as you said, you won the Thurber prize for humor. As, you, a, as an award-winning humorist. You, yeah. As an award-winning humorist. By the way, right? don't try to give anyone, like, so Byron and I, we, we read each other's work and, uh, you know, that's always hard and tough to do. Like what, what hat to wear at the moment? Like, is he asking me? as a spouse, in which case I just want to be like, keep going, you know, good job, you've got this, like encouraging, or is he asking me as another writer? But what doesn't work is like tr me trying to punch up his jokes and being like, well, as an award-winning humorist. <laughs> <laughs> Divorce. You're so lucky, though, that you have a spouse who would actually like. My husband isn't here, so I can say this. That that like reads your work and is like live <laughs> No, but he like wouldn't even he wouldn't even watch me if this was my book. Uh, but I like like I I feel like if I was ever like nominated for a Pulitzer, my husband would be like, so so we're. Were no other books written this year? Was, was okay. it just yours? Well, I'm going to get in trouble because I'm going to get in trouble again because of the live stream. And I told this story and I did not know I was being live streamed. But I told this story and, I, and what the hell? It's the last night of the thing. I'm going to tell it again. I invited my mother to the Thurber uh, Prize with me to be a date. A Byron came too. And so it was the, the three of us. And, and she came and she got off the plane and she said, I've read the other two finalists. I've read all three of your books and I know who's going to win. <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> and now I need to pause here and tell you that, of course, she wanted me to win and she was rooting for me to win. She just didn't think it was going to happen. And it might have been a mother's like protective nature, sure. like, you know, trying to guard sure. against disappointment and all that. Uh, but it was very funny. And then the other two finalists all night were coming up to me and be like, we love your mom. <laughs> I wish she was mine. And I was like, yeah, because she's telling you you're going to win. Yeah. Oh my God, amazing. I know you, like, when you're writing a book, you always forget that you have a mother. You know? <laughs> like, I feel like for people who hit the wedding, I, I mean, I wrote up this, like, this, like, debaucherous, drugged out gay threesome. Uh -huh. And then, like, I was reading the proofs, and then I sent the proofs off, and it was going to get published. And I was like, fuck, I have a mom. <laughs> gonna read this and a mother-in-law who's yeah. gonna read this and yeah. you know what they did <laughs> um, okay so so along that line i wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, about the role that humor plays in your work i feel like um as someone who also tries to be funny occasionally in their work that 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 funny books are often not taken as as, as seriously as like you know is, is like very traumatic literature and which always kind of like like makes me bristle but like what role does humor play in your work and, and why do you think humor is important in literature yeah i was just thinking well first of all um grant is a very funny writer first time event long time fan um <laughs> and so uh i'm so thrilled that, that you're up here with me and, the, and i think it is really difficult i was also just thinking in the back of my head because there was just a movie earlier this year of grant's book the people we hate at the wedding and so ben platt had to enact that crazy threesome and i was like okay. ben platt has a mom sorry i might I just <laughs> like, can maybe on mushrooms right now uh, yeah humor is um you know it's it's such an important part of what and and of what i write and, and strangely i write books about grief and grieving a lot and so why are they so funny and you know when i won the the third prize i almost want to get up there and be like haha i fooled you know i fooled you this is a book about grief um so i don't know why other than for me it's always been the way through it's always mm -hmm. been the way um i've dealt with everything um in my life and and, and you know fortunately i'm not someone who has lost uh you know a ton of, uh, you know, I haven't led an o overtly tragic life. Although I think about, you know, my coming out, which was 30 years ago and in the early 90s at a time when we were losing more people to the AIDS crisis mm -hmm. than even in the 1980s. And, I, I, you know, I, I think I thought that my life was going to be a very lonely and mm. um, uh, sad and short. And 
Um, now I look back on it and I think it, it's been the opposite of that. It's been joyous and filled with community and relatively long, although still, you know, in the greatest scheme of things rather yeah. short <laughs> as I get older every year. Uh, and so, you know, I just want to write joyous books even when they are also about sad things. And mm -hmm. so I don't know, I kind of go to, I kind of go to, for these sort of tear jerkers that are really funny. And both things are hard to do by themselves. And for some reason I'm a glutton for punishment because I try, I try to do both. But also like life is funny. It is funny. Right? Yeah. Like even in like incredibly sad moments, there are moments that are very funny. Whenever I read a book that doesn't have an ounce of humor in it, I'm like, I don't trust this book. I don't, I don't trust this experience of this life because yeah. like, like unfortunately sometimes life can be funny, yeah. right? Yeah. Even in the most traumatic moments. One of the ways that you make your your book in this particular in, in particular the Selburn so funny is that the dialogue and the sensibilities that exist between these these five friends and each one of them has like a very very unique sensibility and a very unique sense of humor which is is really tough to pull off kind of juggling an ensemble cast like that. So can you talk a little bit about that process and how how you managed to do that? Yeah, I think it's it's very difficult to write it's, it's sort of big scenes. I've always had sort of like one per book before where it's like the whole, you know, these disparate storylines come together and mm -hmm. there's finally a lot of people in a scene and it's big and loud and messy. And I, I love reading those scenes and I love watching those scenes in movies. They're very hard to do because to service each character um, and to give them all their own voice and point of view and way of speaking and way of joking and, and to orient the reader so that you're not lost in any given mm -hmm. scene like oh what happened to Naomi oh you got to make sure the reader knows where she is mm -hmm. it's it's all sort of very challenging I don't know that I have an answer for it other than then I would have probably tried to talk myself out of it because <laughs> uh, almost almost every scene in the book it's all the characters are all together yeah. all the time yeah and they're all talking all yeah. the time yeah. which is so, I mean, as a writer, which is so hard to pull off to get that conversation going and to, to signal to the reader, like, you know, where everyone is, as you said, but also how they're all responding to a particular line of dialogue. That's like really, really tough to pull off. Yeah, I think, well, thank you. I, I don't know if I have anything to say other than, other than thank you. But I did try to go back and think of my own friends sometimes. And, you know, it's just remembering how people relate and how people do talk to each other. People who've known each other for 30 years it's not like, don't say that, that hurt my feelings. No, someone's gonna say, I'm gonna fucking kill you, you know? <laughs> and it's like, that's, so it is just like trying to also have these conversations but make them feel grounded in the way that actual friends can take out frustrations and angers. And by the way, there's also crushes and, you know, resentments, but also, you know, they all have different little, different iterations of where they are with each other over these five different, reunions yeah and one thing and this isn't a question that i asked you when we we like prepped this by the way so this is you know all rehearsed doesn't this uh, feel very rehearsed? Well, <laughs> i think it's but, going well but one thing that you do so well in this book this isn't something we talked about but but we were I, doing I, prep and the, who is, the manager brought over these deep fried rice balls delicious 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 and then the prep went downhill then downhill right? downhill then we stopped talking about that and we started talking about the rice balls. Ooh, rice balls but uh who's read the book by the way Sally, keep your hand up. But who's <laughs> who's read the book? Okay, okay, okay. So, so th those of you who have read the book know that like one thing that Stephen does so well is that these characters like really like get into it and they like scream at each other and they yell at each other in a way that that friends do. So, how did you balance that with the the, the very real love that's in this book? Well, not making it seem on the one hand that this was just a book about people yelling at each other and also on the other hand that this wasn't too sentimental yeah alternate title the people who yell at the funerals yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah i don't know <laughs> i don't know other than that, again I, you know i have my own close group of college friends and i yeah. kept just trying to go back to how we relate to one another and we haven't done this i have no such pact like this with our own uh, with my own group of friends, and so that is imagination. But um, I don't know, there's just something really special about those friendships, about people who knew you 
when, mm -hmm. you know, you were full of dreams and your the pieces of your life were not locked into place. It was all potential and unknown and, and who know you and love you now that uh, some of those pieces are, are more locked in. You either know who you ended up with or what career you have or whatnot and love both versions of you. And sometimes those people are the, the you know, bridge that can help you reconcile those two versions of yourself if they don't entirely yeah. overlap. And so I just, it was just like a mission to honor the those friendships, honor yeah. those friendships, but they can be really messy and they yeah. can be, you know, yeah. like life itself, filled with drama. Reminds me of, there's a great line from My So-Called Life, 90s Nostalgia. <laughs> yes, 90s Nostalgia. Yeah, have we talked about that? Have we talked about? Okay, so 90s Nostalgia, let's talk, the line, well, the, Rayon the, line? the Rayon Graph line is like, a, it's something, I'm gonna, I'm gonna screw it up, but it's about how, how a really good friend is someone who watches you and both, who sees you and both allows you to change. Yeah. And so they allow you to evolve, which I think these characters really do in this book. Let's talk about 90s nostalgia. This book is filled with wonderful 90s <laughs> nostalgia, both um, in terms of like the setting of some of the scenes, but then also just how you kind of weave various pop cultural and music references throughout the book. So two, two part question. I hate to be that guy, but two part <laughs> question. One, what um what was like one bit of 90s nostalgia that you were determined to get in this book and two what do you think accounts for the the kind of the, the 90s nostalgia writ large that's happening now because you see it everywhere right you see it in yellow jackets you see it in all kinds of pop culture references um i you know i don't know I, i'm firmly gen x um so that straddles sort of 80s and 90s there's something about um, those of us who went to college in the 90s now being in sort of creative positions and you know I'm, I'm actually good friends with the creator of Yellow Jackets and so she you know w we've talked about the, the 90s a lot mm -hmm. and why it, why it's so important but it's so sort of the last pre-internet moment last you know we didn't have cell phones we didn't have um, you know email or or the ability there wasn't a million streaming services it was a more commonality of language of the pop culture language because we were watching a lot of the same things yeah. um we were listening to a lot of the same things um and there wasn't online forums to talk about we talked about it with each other you know and so i think um you know for us that's it really sort of got locked into place the one that i was absolutely well, the book start uh, almost started with a joke that I had in my head, which was four four funerals and a wedding. And again, these are not yeah. funerals for people who died. These are, you know, the people are very much alive, so it's not right. a tr there's not a high body count in this, in this in this book. But I just that's just something that tickled. I don't even yeah. know if that was night was that nineties or like two thousand. That was nineties, I think. Yeah. I think nineties. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, so I was determined to include that line in the book, which I did. And then the piece that I was absolutely determined to include is not 90s nostalgia, but was each, so the, the each chapter, uh, each section title is a lyric from a Carpenter's song. And I don't know why, other than I love the Carpenters and I'm gonna, de <laughs> I'm determined to make everyone else love them too. But people have a very strong feeling about uh, the Carpenters, but um, girl drummers, come on. Yeah, come on. Um, and so, oh, I was gonna say, I, I think there's something about, you know, people my age or people who were coming of age in the 90s yeah. that that was, a, you know, the Carpenters were like a safe moment of driving around with our parents, you know, maybe uh -huh. doing errands or in the car, listening to AM Gold, like that, what, there was something about the safety of the way sure. those songs in those lyrics sort of always make me feel like it, like protected in a way. And, and so, um, even though it's not 90s, it sort of creeped into this book. That's really lovely. Thank you, but you hate the Carpenters? No, I love the Carpenters, are you kidding me? I love it. Uh, okay, so one last question. Um, before we open it up. Before we open it up to, to, to all of you. Yeah, start thinking of questions. Um, not about mushrooms, or about mushrooms. Or about mushrooms. Uh, so, uh, I want you to recommend three books and tell us one book you wish you had written. Oh, God. Uh, well, for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to take your books just off the table off because the table. it would just seem very self-serving too. Yeah. Uh, but I love, I, but I absolutely love. And in fact, we have creepy overlap where I think a couple times we've gone we're for a similar reference in uh, Joan Didion. Joan Didion in our books, yeah. <laughs> and the Gunkle is a good Joan Didion book. In your book, uh, we 
we shouldn't do that again. We can't do that again. Let's not. Let's, do that. Do Let's that. not do that again. There's also a great uh, Joan Didion uh, subplot. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, the books that. Uh, well, first of all, I, I find I finally just read Lessons in Chemistry, oh, yeah. um, yes. which I had not read for a very long time because I didn't like the cover, <laughs> <laughs> which is terrible. Um, I would tell you not to judge. And me. Okay. I know there's there's a saying about that. Uh, <laughs> But I really loved it, and I was very impressed with the humor in that book. That was a very funny book. Because, again, a lot of times we're asked to read books, or recommended books, because they're so funny. Oh, you write funny. This is funny. And then I'm like, I don't think it's as funny as everybody else. But yeah. this book was genuinely funny. Um, the book that... So I've, I was also, like, talking a lot about books about friendship um, and groups of friends. Um, and so uh, there's another book, The Interesting... Um, Meg Blitzer. Um, the book that I wish I had kind of written because my first novel was called Lily and the Octopus um, was The Friend by Sigrid oh. Nunez. Uh, I think a book about so a, good about friendship and about grief and about uh, a dog, which is like at the intersection of yeah. everything that I write, except yeah. she did it in a way that I could you know, only aspire to, and then I think won the National Book Award. It was so wonderful. Yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. Really wonderful. Okay. Questions from all of you? We've answered them all. <laughs> what was it like being a mushroom? No. <laughs> <laughs> Author George Lou Clark, everyone. Yes! Um, well, you've been on book two now, so the book's been out for a while, so you're starting to talk to readers and have them respond to you about what they love about it. I'm curious, is everyone kind of bringing their own uh, experience to you, or are there kind of big themes in, in what's reaching people's hearts? So the question for the, the folks who are live streaming, live streaming this is, you've been on tour for a while now, and, and, and are people, are readers coming to you with their own experiences? Or are they responding to, to the experiences in the book? Yeah, it's a great joy. And thank you to the, the writers, and there are several here tonight who have come out. I, I've been very touched by writers who come out to these events and support other writers, and that's really lovely, always. Um, it is interesting to have been on tour for as long as I have been, where the first night, you know, release night, no one's read the book because the book just literally yeah. just came out. And and now people, a couple weeks in, people have had a chance to read the book. Um, I think uh, what I am most moved by are the readers who tell me who they're inspired to, you know, upon the theme of, of telling the people in your life what they mean to you now and not waiting. Mm -hmm. uh, readers telling me who is someone who's important to, and maybe they've lost touch, an old friend or someone, a teacher, someone they ha have had this incredible impact on their life and that they are now going to get in touch with to tell them that. Um, and I think that's the most rewarding thing mm -hmm. about uh, about people who have read the book or, or the most rewarding thing that I'm hearing. Yeah, Lovely. yeah it really is. Yeah. At, at the risk of getting too sentimental. Yeah. Yes. Um, for all of your books, I find that the characters really stay with me so much and really just like stay in your heart. They feel so real. They feel like absolutely real people. Um, do you find it hard when you finish a book to say goodbye to those characters and do you have a process for that? Oh, that is a great question. <laughs> so the, the question, in, in case anyone didn't hear it or the people at home, but the, the, the characters in Stephen books, I totally agree, feel incredibly real, incredibly lived in. Um, people you would know. Do when you're done writing a book, do you have a process of saying goodbye to those characters, and do you miss those characters when they're gone? Um, well, I have a, a funny answer and a sincere answer. The, the funny one is I I don't know. Did anybody listen to the book on audio by any chance? Yeah, a couple people. Here. So I narrated the the audio book, um, which uh, I've done twice now for the Gunkle as well. By the way, and I'm gonna say this with my my editor here too. I don't think they necessarily thought the publisher thought it was a great idea that I do this, and I had to record a, a bit of myself reading as a as a little audition before I got to do that. Um, and so, um, what was my point? Oh, but they rented me this very nice studio, recording studio, professional recording studio in Palm Springs, where I live. If you've read the Conco, you know about Palm Springs. It's hot, right? And the first thing they have to do is turn off the air conditioning because the microphone picks up the hum of the oh air conditioning. And so recording an audiobook, it's me in the recording booth. There's a window and there's like a, a man, a, an audio engineer uh, on the outside of that. And I'm talking to a director uh, who's in New York or LA, I forget, in the headphones. 
But anyway, I finished reading The Celebrants and the audio engineer looked through the window and looked at me and piped in through the sound system. He goes, oh, look at you. You finished your book, you're crying. Ah. <laughs> you're crying. And I said, I'm not crying, I'm sweating. <laughs> but I was also crying, but I didn't want to tell him that. You know? um, but I had that thought in the moment, like, oh, this is the last time I will ever read this book. Yeah. Um, and it was a moment to sort of let go hmm. of those characters. And yeah, I may read a little, a little snippet here and there, but I'll never read the whole book hmm. from start to finish again. Hmm. Um, I think this, the serious answer though is, um, I miss the kids from the Gunkle. Uh, and it is because I think for, you know, for them, their real grief journey was gonna start at the end of that summer when they went home and their mom wasn't there. And so I think about them. I think about them and I want to know they're okay. What? <laughs> no promises, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of going off of that question, you've written a lot of grief, a lot of really difficult scenes. How do you get yourself mentally prepared when you know that's where you have to write for the day? And then how do you kind of decompress and kind of get yourself out of that headspace after you've written it? That's a great question too. Yeah. So how do you write difficult scenes that are filled with grief and how do you then decompress from writing those scenes? Mushrooms. Next yeah. question. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, it, it, it is, you've got to be prepared to go there. Um, but I will say, I, I, particularly for my first novel, Lily and the Octopus, which is about a dog, you know, we know what happens in dog books. And so I know there are many people, as many people who love that book, there are as many people who have come up to me and said, I can't, I just can't read it. Mm -hmm. I just cannot read it. And I always want to tell people, you know, at least with my books, um, I'm not just going to lead you to the edge of a cliff and be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to bring you back. Like, trust me to bring you back afterwards. Yeah. And so I, you know, I have to t tell myself that too, like promise myself I, I will I, I go to a dark place, but I will pull back. And again, it's it's that humor. It's knowing when to employ it. And sometimes it feels very surgical for me, you know, and I, and I work very closely uh, with my editor too, because it is, um, you know, you can write one joke too many in a scene mm -hmm. and it can entirely just suck the emotional um, impact that you're trying to have with that, we're trying to accomplish. And also you can go too long without a joke mm -hmm. and without giving the reader the ability to take a breath with a laugh and that can wake the scene in, in, in the opposite direction and so it really is sometimes with a with a scalpel you know we'll work together a red pen but you know scalpel um, to figure that out anyone else hi uh um, so were there any scenes that were edited out of the book? And if so, can you share them? Oh. <laughs> Should we get Sally up here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, were there any scenes yeah. that were edited out of the book? And would you be comfortable sharing them if there were? With your favorite? Um, there's always things, there's always small things that get pulled out. I think for me, it's the opposite. I think... Um, I'll turn in a draft. I, I don't know if you've all noticed this about me or not, but I'm not the biggest plot heavy <laughs> writer. Uh, I'm much more interested in character and emotion and putting these characters together and seeing <coughs> them work their stuff out. Um, and so sometimes there, and it was absolutely the, tr the case with this book, is there's more that gets added after the first draft to address sometimes not a lot happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that happened with the Gunkle as well, I think, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. Um, what's your writing practice like and any tips for staying on track for the project? Oh gosh. What's your writing practice like? And What's any any tips for staying on track? Mushrooms. What yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's the worst. That's the worst. Uh, I would love to hear you answer. I have another book due, so could you teach me? <laughs> you write that much faster than I do. I don't know about that. Uh, 
Do you, uh, well, I'm going to make you answer this one too because I want to know for my... But for me, it's like I do try to write in the morning because the day will throw every mm -hmm. excuse at you not to write. You know, like, oh, we're out of almond milk. I better go to the store for nine <laughs> hours. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and then in the couple months leading up to publication, it's very it can be very busy doing publicity and marketing things and stuff like that. So then I've had to switch my writing to the evenings and, you know, because I live on the West Coast publisher here in New York. So I know after two or three o'clock, I'll, I'll stop getting emails and, and then quiet down a little bit. And then, so I've had to train myself to switch, but I'm gonna go back to being a morning writer, I think. Yeah, I think writing in the mornings, I also have like kind of stopped believing in inspiration because, <laughs> no, I really mean that. I think that if you trick yourself into thinking that like you need inspiration to sit down and write, you're never gonna write. I think that you like write one sentence and if that sentence doesn't work, you write the next sentence and then you write the next sentence and you write the next sentence and eventually the sentences will start working and then you start writing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, inspiration is dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's my That's yeah. Um, so I don't have the exact timeline, but since you had narrated the audiobook for the Gunkle, were there any conscious choices that you made in writing or editing the celebrants? thinking that you would be narrating it and kind of thinking about that process and how it was the first time? Oh, wow, that's a fascinating question. These are These are all great good questions. Questions. And, uh, you know, writing process, I've heard that one before. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but how wonderful to get deep, this deep in a tour and be getting questions that I haven't heard. Yeah, before. so so for anyone who's live streaming, the, the question was, after you did the audiobook for the Gunkel, did that affect essentially how you wrote or edited the celebrants knowing that you would also be doing the audiobook for for the celebrants uh i didn't know i would be doing the audiobook for the celebrants but i will uh, there is an answer to this question and i did not give any of the characters a lisp <laughs> 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 which if you read the gunkle you know i thought i was so smart i thought i was so smart i'm like uh, i'm not gonna have to tag every piece of dialogue <laughs> it'll be i want to go he said she said Maisie said grant said it'll be clear which child is talking and then it came time to narrate the audiobook, and I went, son of a bitch. You know, like, <laughs> who wrapped <wrote this? laughs> So everyone speaks flawlessly. <laughs> the list did inspire that question. Uh, I love that it did. I love that it did. Yeah, I think, you know, in performing the list, I tried to do the same thing that I did in writing it, which is like not punch it too hard like skin you know get in and get out because you don't want to confuse mm -hmm. i don't want to, the, the reader to come across the sentence and be like what what is this child trying to say you know, yeah. just hint at it enough that it can put that little bit of voice in your ear and, yeah. then, and then keep going yeah that's a great question though. more <laughs> I love it. I'll, I'll be here all that. I know yeah. you, got, you have lives and the, the yeah. stores, you know, we're after hours already, but I love the enthusiasm for the last night. I'm going to ask you a question that's probably one you've heard before, so I'm sorry that I don't have something as original. <laughs> but the sentiment has been shared a lot tonight that you write characters so well and we really love spending time with them, and I'm so curious if you have a favorite in this book. Oh. <laughs> You know, I thought of asking that question, too. Um, do you have a favorite character in The Celebrants? Ooh, um, that's a hard one. And, you know, I do have my own group of college friends. There's no one-to-one -one parallel. So I want them to know I'm not picking favorites, uh, <laughs> characters based on anyone uh, in real life. And, and the truth of this, and I wonder if you feel this, too, is that there's a little bit of me, you know, in every single character, too. Yeah. Um, you know, even when I wrote The Editor, which was about a young writer's relationship with his editor, who was Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, um, that I can do all the research in the world, but there's that 5% yeah. that you can't study, and then it's a, it's a little bit of me mixed in with, with Jackie, because it's, it's that X factor. Um, and so it's hard to choose because they're all um, a little bit me too, different sides of me. Um, but I will say I have a special place in my heart for Naomi, um, in that she is the one who will strike at your insecurity first because she does not want you to expose mm -hmm. hers. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I do that with my <laughs> comments and snarks. On <laughs> yeah. Maybe I do it a little. Well, she's also like kind of the most dynamic character in the book, 
right? I mean, she... Yeah, when you're stuck, you can always count on her to come in and yeah. yell something. Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. others to yeah. jumpstart the scene a little bit, yeah. I'm trying to think about who my favorite character is oh. in The Celebrants. Who is your favorite character in The Celebrants? Knocking this thing over. Uh, is it the six four college swimmer right. Jordy? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I actually think that it's Naomi as well because she's she's also the most surprising. Like her, the 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 her evolution as a character, I think, ends up being very surprising. Yeah, I would agree. Yes. Was there any scene that was very hard to get through when narrating, like the skydiving scene or something that <laughs> you really struggled to? <laughs> Complete. That's a great question too. I, I, I mean, you all should just do this next time. Um, was there any scene that was incredibly difficult to narrate, such as the skydiving scene, and, and when you were doing the audiobook? Yeah, that the skydiving scene is a good example. By the way, for those who haven't read the book um, and you want to go skydiving, go now, <laughs> <laughs> then read the book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Buy it now. Buy it today, just in case anything happens. But yeah. you don't have to read it. <laughs> no, no, no. I promise this guy I scene is a, a, lot, a lot of fun. Um, that uh, that was hard to read because uh, je parle of français, un peu, un peu de français. Uh, but I do not speak Spanish, and there was a lot of Spanish in that scene. So that was, uh, you know, I wanted to get that just right. But also, there were there's a lot of yelling in that scene because they're, you know, the plane door is open and the winds yeah. are blowing. And I constantly, like had to rock like away away from the microphone to get to, to yell the dialogue because i was going to blow out the mic so it was a, that was a technical challenge <laughs> um i do think that the hardest scene for me to get through was almost the, the finale the swim yeah i don't i don't want to spoil anything else but yeah don't say was, anything else i won't say anything else but that was the hardest uh for me to to get through Since you write humor, how often do you find yourself laughing out loud at your own? <laughs> <laughs> as you're writing? Oh, we're getting into it now. <laughs> uh, you know what? You just continue laughing. I'll repeat for the live stream. The question was how often? Sorry. Sorry. How often do I laugh at my own jokes? <laughs> <laughs> it was two glasses of wine. Yeah. Well, let me tell you. Uh, you know, the return on investment for a humorist in, no in writing in the novel format is terrible, Yeah. right? It takes years to write a book sometimes. Uh, publishing is a very long lead industry, so even after I'm done writing it, um, it could be another 15, 18 months before the book comes out. And then, oh, by the way, I'm not even there when someone reads it, you know, unless I'm hiding in your bushes. <laughs> it's not beneath me uh, <laughs> to see if I get a laugh. <laughs> um, so yeah, sometimes I'm typing away and I will, uh, I don't think I make myself laugh in the moment, but sometimes when I, you know, send the book off and it comes back for copy edits later, it's been months since I, I've read it and then I'll have forgotten and I laugh, then I'm like, <laughs> 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 uh, that's, all, that's always fun. But then it really is like, oh, I'm not, uh, you know, I can't, I don't know if you, it might just be delirious you know, uh, exhaustion at this point, but like, I enjoy the laugh, so uh, to not be there is, is a little torturous. Um, it's just like the other part where like my husband comes in, I'll like read a joke to him in a book and he'll yeah. be like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. Uh, I think we have time for, for one more question. One more, yes, in the back. Oh. Oh, Clever. <laughs> so this is the end of your tour. This is the last question. <laughs> do you wish there was a question that you have not been asked, or that you do you wish there was a question that you had been asked that you would not been asked? You know what? I made up all these characters. I made up this pact. I made up the plot. I made up the book. I wrote everything. I'm not writing the tour. <laughs> That's on you, people. Uh, I, <laughs> that is just a step too far, mister. Um, you know, I, uh, I it's hard to come up with in the, in the hot seat at the, at the moment. I'm sure there is. 
I'll come up with a great, uh, I'll come up with a great one tomorrow <laughs> and, uh, and I'll message it to you from the plane. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Books for Magic. Thank this you. is really thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for supporting independent bookstores. This is really great. I mean, a second location for Books for oh, Magic is so great. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Could you get another round of applause for Stephen? And one for Grant. And one for Tylenol PM. It's the only way I've gotten through. If you guys could give moment this, uh, Stephen a moment to get settled, we're going to have him sign at the desk near where my colleague is pointing right now. If you wouldn't mind lining up there with your belongings so we could begin to break down the room, we'd really appreciate that. Have a good night. I spilled a little. Why are you off?